Another question, now moving to the topic of, topic of patellar instability. A high school softball player has chronic activity-related anterior knee pain with no history of instability. Which finding would more likely indicate a lateral retinacular release? Congruence angle, Q angle, sulcus angle, lateral patellofemoral angle, or patella height index? And this is the lateral patellofemoral angle because this is not a patient with instability, but a patient with compression. A lateral release not being indicated for patellar instability. Patella baja is most likely to occur after which of the following procedures? I think we know this one. Dr. Pagnano just talked to us about this. High tibial osteotomy. Patellar instability can occur after acute acute traumatic event. This occurs equally in males and females, but is, but is very often associated with chronic laxity, and this is more likely to be in women associated with malalignment. For this patellar instability, it often occurs in the second to third decades of life in women, and the miserable malalignment syndrome is often noticed. The increased Q angle with associated femoral aniversion, genu valgum, external tibial torsion, and pronated feet. Other risk factors, factors include patella alta, because the patella does not articulate with the sulcus, trochlear dysplasia, excessive lateral patellar tilt measured in extension, and lateral femoral condyle hypoplasia. The mechanism of injury is usually non-contact, but a twisting injury to the knee with the knee ex extended and the foot externally rotated. The anatomy, Mark also talked about this, the, the medial patellofemoral ligament being the primary restraint in the first 20 degrees of knee flexion. It is important to know that the femoral insertion origin is between the medial epicondyle and the adductor tubercle. Significantly, this is the usual site of an avulsion of the MPFL. The patellofemoral bony structures account for stability in deeper knee flexion. Dynamic stability provided by the vastus medialis, which also attaches to the MPFL. On physical examination, there is, for a, a patellar instability event, there is often uh, tenderness over the MPFL. There may be a significant hemarthrosis, an increase in patellar translation. We measure this in quadrants, and its normal motion is less than two quadrants of patellar translation. So lateral translation of the medial border of the patella to the lateral edge of the trochlear groove is considered two quadrants. And this is considered an abnormal amount of translation. When we look at x-rays, we want to look at um, AP and lateral views as well. The AP view showing overall limb alignment and the lateral view giving us an opportunity to look at patellar height. Blumensite's line should extend from the inferior pole of the patella at 30 degrees of knee flexion, so the line extends to the inferior pole. If we also looking at the insole salvati method, again, this is the measurement between the length of the patella and the length of the patellar tendon. The, the normal is between 0 0.8 and 1.2, so the, the distance from the inferior pole of the patella to the tibia and the distance of the patella is about 1 plus or minus 0.2. The sunrise or merchant views are best to assess for lateral patellar tilt and also to look at the lateral patellofemoral angle. The normal is that the angle would open laterally. How is patellar instability treated? With anti-inflammatory medication, activity modification, and physical therapy. Initially, short-term immobilization simply for comfort, and then six weeks of exercising and control motion, mainly doing closed chain short arc quadriceps exercises, quadriceps strengthening, but not forgetting about, about core and hip strengthening exercises to, because these are important 
to improve balance and limb positioning. And sometimes a stabilizing sleeve may be used. And you should remember that if the patient has a tense effusion, they may be helped by an aspiration. And being careful to look for flat, fat globules as, well, globules as well, as these could indicate a fracture. When is surgery indicated? If there is a loose body with displaced osteochondral fractures, then surgery, surgery should be performed. The MPFL should be repaired if there's a first time dislocation with a bony fragment. For recurrent instability, the MPFL can be re reconstructed with autograft or allograft. The common techniques for autograft would be using the gracilis or semitendinosus. And the femoral origin can, re can be readily found radiographically at the shot point. Other operations to treat this may include a Fulkerson-type osteotomy with anterior and medial tibial tubercle transfer. This would not be, um, this would be used with a tibial tubercle trochlear group distance greater than 20 millimeters on CT. So this anteriorly, this mo it moves the tibial tuberosity both anteriorly and medially, taking stress off the patella but also translating medially. When the, the goal is to correct the tibial tubercle trochlear groove distance to 10 to 15 millimeters, being careful not to, to make that distance less than 10 millimeters. Other, other methods to treat patellar instability may be tibial tubercle distalization or moving the tibial tuberosity further down the tibia to treat patella alta. Lateral release is no longer indicated for isolated instability. Only indicated there is excessive lateral tilt or tightness after medialization has been accomplished. Trochleoplasty can be performed to treat trochlear dysplasia, but it, it is rarely done in our country. Recurrent dislocation. With non-operative treatment, this may be as high as 15 to 50 percent at two to five years. Medial patellofemoral dislocation and medial patellofemoral arthritis are usually iatrogenic in nature. We have made things too tight on the medial side. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.